everyone. Welcome to this day. It is Tuesday, July 27th, and we have a few meetings to tell you about today. We've got the first one, which will be at 930 in the morning, and that is the Disaster Preparedness Task Force. Always a good thing to follow along with that, and you can do that either in the boardroom or virtually. Then at 1.30 this afternoon, we have the United Finance Committee, also in the boardroom or virtual. And 2 p.m. is the third board special open meeting. And again, that will also be in the boardroom and virtual. And if you are following along virtually, you can go to Laguna Woods meet, or sorry, lagunawoodsvillage.com forward slash meetings. Now on our show today, we have devoted the entire time to our Orange County Sheriff Don Barnes. He's got lots of great information, so he will take up our entire time. And uh, always good to talk to him because he really sheds some light on our local uh, situations happening right here in Laguna Woods as well as Southern Orange County. All right, our, take a look at our weather. It is looking warm after we burn off our fog here. It's a little bit foggy this morning, but we will have the AM clouds, but it is going to be warm, 84.69. Tomorrow, 84.68. Thursday, 85.66. Into the weekend, we are looking at 8467 and 8368. Our sunrise this morning was at 6 a.m. And our sunset will be at 755. And this photo is out of Red Rock, Arizona. So, or excuse me, Red Rock in Nevada. So very cool watching the guys climb up that uh, sheer face there on the front. Scary stuff. All right, if you have a photo that you would like to share with us about uh, something in our community or a destination that you have been to, please email it to lagunawoodsvillagetv at gmail.com. When we return, we will speak with Sheriff Don Barnes, so stick around. There are many treasures within the walls of Laguna Woods Village. The foundation of Laguna Woods Village is one of them. Nowhere in the nation has a community embraced a commitment to assist its own residents with temporary emergency support. Since 1997, the foundation makes that support available through donations by individuals, clubs, organizations, and bequests. Help the foundation to help the real treasures within the village, our friends and neighbors. Welcome back. Well, today I am joined by Orange County Sheriff Don Barnes. How are you doing? I am doing well. Thank you for asking. It's been a very difficult 17 months on everybody. We've been very busy within the Sheriff's Department driving our response to the pandemic, both in resources and uh, personnel and of course the jails have been impacted there as well. We've had uh, over 60 protests after the incident that took the life of George Floyd uh, over a year ago. Had three wildfires in support of our brothers and sisters at the Orange County Fire Authority and we've been very busy but I'm proud to be serving as the Sheriff of Orange County. Well we're certainly glad that you are here with us as well and like you said, there's been a lot going on, not just in our county, but across the nation. And I think it's just really making an awful lot of people not only confused, but concerned. And so I'm, I'm happy that you're able to be here with us and help maybe dispel some of the things that, you know, might be misinforming our community. So first and foremost, uh, let's maybe start with the jails and how things are going there. Jails are going well. In fact, I'm really one of the greatest, I think, travesties or impacts of COVID was all the work that was underway before the COVID pandemic came with some of the infrastructure improvements we were doing within our jails for programming. Uh, if your viewers may be aware of it on your show before, but in a pre-COVID population, we have about between 5,300 and 6,000 people who are incarcerated in, in the Orange County Jail on any given day during normal times. and about 40% of those people who are entrusted to our care have a daily nexus to mental health treatment. That's about 2,000 people on any day that you have, uh, receiving mental health treatment. We have between 120 uh, to uh, down as low as 100 people who are medically supervised detoxing off of substances such as alcohol and or drugs. Mm -hmm. And we have a significant population who are experiencing homelessness and having all those 
uh, people here creates an opportunity for us. And I'm not saying opportunities because they're incarcerated, but we've tried to connect them to services while they're in custody to get them both into mental health stability and into sobriety. And then when they're getting ready to be released, connecting them to post custody programming so they can maintain their success while they're in our jails. And that's dependent on a lot of factors, but we have a lot of good programs that we're doing. And many of these things now are being built out now that COVID is kind of waning and allowing us to do some of the infrastructure improvements and continue with some of the programming that we are going to do. One program I'm really excited about within our jails, and it's potentially a grant opportunity, but we're going to move towards it. Whether we get the grant opportunity for, through the federal government or not, is bringing back vocational training within our, our correctional facility. And this has gone by the wayside decades ago within jails and some prisons, but we're going to bring back vocational training opportunities for men and women in our jails. Uh, things like welding and electrical or whatever other uh, skill that we can build upon them so that when they do get released, they get released into an employment opportunity with a prevailing wage and hopefully break that cycle of recidivism that occurs uh, too, all too frequently. Our, our job is to, I want to put myself out of business. I don't want to be running a jail. And I, if I can keep people from coming back, that's the biggest half of the equation by stopping the cycle of incarceration. And we're really all in on this and very proud of our staff with some of the programs they're creating. I didn't realize that the vocational program had gone away. You said it, it, it's been, it hasn't been in place for quite some time. Yeah, a lot of the jails because of either lack of funding, uh, and there's a lot of reasons why, but lack of funding is one of them, but we're trying to make an effort to put an investment in the people who are here so that we can put them back on their feet, lift them up, and put them on a path for success, if they're willing. I can't make everybody participate, obviously, but right. a lot of the vocational trainings have kind of gone by the wayside over the years because of funding funding lapse. And this grant opportunity that may be coming through Congress uh, will bring up, up to half a million dollars of monies into the county. There's a match component. We will match that if we have the ability. This It's a small match. And uh, we'll be able to put this together. We've been talking towards this end, though, even without this grant opportunity, we've been talking towards implementing these programs with a Santa Ana College, who would be the educational component of it. They bring the teachers in to teach these classes. Some capital improvements have to be made for workshops and things that allow the environment for the training to take place. But I think it's the right move to do, and I'm very excited about moving that direction. Now, of course, uh, you turn on your TV and all you hear about is border security, border this, border that. And it's been, it's been concerning because you've got states like the state of Texas who are trying to do their own wall and you know and it's very concerning because you know we just don't know what the magnitude is of how many people might be coming over and who is coming over and and we've talked a lot about in the past the fentanyl issue and it just seems like it's getting worse so maybe you can help me understand and help my community understand what this what's going on there and, and what's going to happen going forward Sure. So first, obviously, there is a component of a humanitarian effort at the border, and nobody denies that. But that crisis that's being created at the border is being driven by the cartels, the drug trafficking organizations. And I think it's hard for sometimes a general viewer of the news to see the criminal enterprise that takes place at our border. And let me assure you that nobody gets into this country without being uh, the, without the cartels profiting off of it. They get paid to do that. And this surge of young people, children at the border is a strategy from the drug trafficking organizations. And I'll, I'll tell you this way, and your viewers may be shocked to learn this, but the CBP, Customs and Border Patrol, 40% of their staff are babysitting young people who are brought, children that are brought up to the border. And that's a strategy by the cartels to divert resources away from the border, which means the border becomes very it's not secured, it's not patrolled, it becomes very porous. And that creates several opportunities that creates risk. First is, of course, the human trafficking component that takes place of those people. And some of these people are trying to gain access to our country aren't just people coming for work opportunities. They're mm -hmm. bad actors. We know that we are stopping people at the border who are on no-fly lists from uh, countries out of Africa who have ill intent. And we are catching them, but that means we may not be catching all of them which of course is a very tricky and high risk circumstance. Then we have the issues with uh, drug trafficking that takes place. And we've seen a surge in drug trafficking. Uh, methamphetamine is still the highest traffic narcotic by weight. The fentanyl is probably in my opinion, one of the most dangerous. It's a 
It's a, a synthetic opioid, which is easier to produce, less costly to produce than heroin, and it's 50 times more potent than opium is. So it has a high probability of uh, causing death amongst our folks. Several years ago, I've, I've been proposing legislation being carried by Senator Pat Bates out of Laguna Niguel for some time, and we, have, we can't get it through the California legislature, but uh, we have seen an increase year to year of trafficking of pure fentanyl, which if you touch it, have a skin contact, it can be lethal for you uh, by contacting that. Uh, right. We've seen the weights go up significantly just this last year. Combined over the last several years, we've seized 388 pounds of pure right. fentanyl. That's 88 million doses of fentanyl coming into our country from south of the border that we've intervened, interdicted, and seized. But there's a lot still getting through. And we are the gateway to the uh, rest the rest of the Western United States through by the I-5 and I-15 corridor coming from south of the border. And then we have the issue with fentanyl-related deaths that are taking place as well. Right. Notice I did not call them an overdose because it's not. Uh, we have young people, teens and young adults who are buying, although illegally, trying to get access to what they believe are uh, pharmaceutical narcotics such as Xanax or Oxycontin or Oxycodone, but these have no medicinal chemicals in it. They're pure fentanyl being laced and misrepresented as those pills and our young adults and children are taking them. In fact, three out of four parents will find when their child dies from a fentanyl related, fentanyl related death, find their child in their bedroom the morning after who has already been deceased. And that's a pretty tragic circumstance. Fentanyl related deaths have gone up every single year over the last several years. Year to date, in the first half of 2020, there are 1,550 fentanyl-related deaths, and that's going to double from the previous year. We've seen a 1,441% increase. That's a 1,400% increase in fentanyl-related deaths over the last several years, and it's going to be uh, our new. We have we just dealt with a pandemic. This is going to be a new uh, epidemic pandemic that this country is going to be dealing with, which is the fentanyl related deaths as these drugs keep on trafficking across the border, which is why we need some semblance of border security to stop these, these ill-intended people by bringing either bad actors, drugs, or other things into our country. Now, fentanyl is not made here in the United States, is it? No, it's, well, there is a pharmaceutical use for fentanyl. So it does have a pharmaceutical use, a medicinal use. Generally, it's intended with a fentanyl patch for those who are um, in quite honestly the last stages of life, usually because of for cancer treatment, when the pain is too high to tolerate and they'll use the fentanyl time release patch. The fentanyl is being clandestine produced south of the border it's trafficked in. And it's easier to traffic because one kilo of fentanyl is equivalent to 50 kilos of heroin. So it's easier to traffic in, has much greater value to the cartels than just heroin. In fact, most users of who are addicts, the drug addicts, or those who have, have substance use disorders, are seeking out deliberately fentanyl for that better high, if you will, and they won't buy just pure or just uh, heroin unless it's laced with fentanyl for that better product, which is a sad reflection of where we're going. And even beyond that, there's a new opioid synthetic called carfentanil, which is 100 times more potent than fentanyl, which is 50 times more potent than than uh, opium. We put a program in place five years ago called naloxone. Naloxone is an uh, opioid antagonist. It's a nasal spray like Narcan. All of our deputies carry it in patrol. We've had hundreds of interventions with this, uh, with um, Narcan or naloxone and been able to save a lot of lives by intervening first. And oftentimes we're the first people on scene because we're oftentimes transit mobile in the community. So when I talk about those fentanyl related deaths, though that doesn't include, and thank God, that does not include all the lives we've saved who didn't lose their lives because we intervened appropriately and saved the lives of young people who are just making poor decisions. So we want to get them back on their feet. Right. Tell me, tell me again the name of what you just mentioned. It was a it's a nasal spray. It's called naloxone. It's like Narcan. Narcan is in is a, a administered uh, with a needle. Um, Naloxone is a nasal spray. All of our deputies have been trained by medical professionals. They can administer it. It's also available over the counter. A lot of these users oftentimes well, that use uh, fentanyl 
will oftentimes have naloxone with them. So if somebody, one of their friends is using, goes too far, they try to bring them back to life. It's really a strange kind of environment in which some of these people, people operate, but it's also very dangerous because you're risking, literally risking their lives on the fringe of how far they can go with drug use. Is it an instantaneous thing? So once you've sprayed it, 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 it instantaneously revives you? It brings them right back. It's like watching somebody come back from the dead. And it depends. It, they, it, sometimes it takes multiple doses. It could take two, three, four, five. The tricky thing with carfentanil, which is the other uh, much more potent form of fentanyl, it's, it's being billed as a fentanyl, uh, a, a naloxone resistant fentanyl. It's not resistant to to, uh, to naloxone, it's just so potent that there isn't enough fentanyl to intervene and stop the, the, the synapse from triggering. It actually blocks the effects of the opioid, but it's so potent that there's not enough naloxone potent enough to get to intervene and block uh, car fentanyl, or, or even a very high dose of fentanyl can not be reversed. We've had yep. tremendous success, but it's not that's not the answer. The answer is to intervene and stop this narcotic from coming into the country, and then educate young adults and anybody off of that, and then to treat them appropriately to get them back into sobriety and maintain that sobriety long term. Exactly, exactly. But like you said, we need to cut off the source first before we can really address some of these other things. So, so thank you for that information. Uh, frightening stuff for sure. Uh, so moving to it in a kind of a different direction is you know cybersecurity is something that. You know, Laguna Woods Village was, uh, we were attacked. I mean, we had a cyber attack and uh, malware and, you know, it was it was crazy. And we aren't the only ones, of course. There's so many others across the nation that are having this happen. And it's it's mostly being done by by other countries. However, you know, you, you are now part of something that is, is, is maybe not so much dealing with other countries, but what we're having right here in our own backyard. Yeah, I was recently appointed to the uh, two two different actually uh, committees. The first is the Criminal Intelligence Coordinating Council, which is a, a group of law enforcement professionals that work with California Department of Justice, uh, Department of Homeland Security, FBI, other federal partners to have discussions about connectivity of uh, technology and how we can appropriately intervene with some of these strategies. The other is with the major county sheriffs of America, I was appointed to the intelligence commander group chair. I chair this committee that represents sheriffs across the nation and other police chiefs and other organizations, Fusion Center Network, uh, intelligence analysts and others about how to appropriately and constitutionally correct it. I wanna make sure that people know this. We look at intelligence and we operate in a constitutionally protected environment to share information to make sure that we don't repeat 9-11 uh, two decades ago. So it's all about connecting the dots, making sure we are aware of the threat horizon. The one thing that is probably the greatest risk, in my opinion, and probably shared by others in this profession, is two decades ago when 9-11 happened, that was foreign bad actors, uh, the Taliban, ISIS, Al-Qaeda, that were acting abroad trying to get people or get access into our country. Today, mm -hmm. our greatest threat is domestic violent, uh, homegrown extremists. But domestic terrorism presents a very significant risk. And that's where that southern border really comes into play when you have people that want to get access in here. But also they're gaining access to people by remotely recruiting them using technology such as the dark web and other avenues, social media platforms where they can recruit them. The greatest risk today is not, you know, 20 people trying to fly in planes into buildings. That still presents a risk, but we've intervened and prevented that for two decades. Now it's spontaneous bad actors who aren't even on the grid. They act out without being known to law enforcement and act in a very malicious way. It's like driving cars into people or stabbing or spontaneous attacks. Those things are very, very high risk. And I think that this ability to represent not just Orange County, but the nation and these two committees is uh, first a compliment. I'm very appreciative that I had the opportunity to be selected to do that. And some people may ask, why is Orange County involved? We have our own fusion center in Orange County. That's the second highest producing fusion center in the nation. Fusion centers is an information intelligence vetting network of open source information and dialogue that takes place laterally across the, the law enforcement spectrum. So we've been very deep into this business. Actually, before 9-11 even happened, we were in this, in this arena trying to stop bad things from happening. Right. But it's also, uh, Orange County is a very high risk target 
nationally. We're actually 14th on the national platform for risk as a community. And people may not realize that. We kind of get overshadowed by Los Angeles and some of the big cities. But when it comes to commerce and tourism and industry, we are an economy in and of ourselves. So to be able to represent and protect us that way is huge. When you talked about the risk to, uh, you mentioned Laguna Woods Village and the attack that happened specifically. This happens every single day. There are foreign bad actors trying to ping and infiltrate our data systems on a very routine basis. And you have a very unique population in Laguna Woods Village that I'm very endearing to, but it's also very high risk for other forms of attack through scams and other things. So I'll reiterate, we've covered this topic before, but uh, don't click on emails from people you don't know. Don't open attachments from people that emails that come into you. They're oftentimes malicious and will have malware and other types of things that can take over your operating system and never give personal or uh, information or financial information to anybody over the phone. These are people trying to get that information so they can steal from you. And I will be very clear on this. The IRS, the Orange County Sheriff's Department, they do not call you and tell you that you, they, you owe them money. There are other avenues in which that happens, but we will never call you and say, we need you to donate to a cause or ask you to pay off a warrant or something like that. Please do not fall, fall prey to those, those scams. They work. The, the, the amount of money being lost through cyber scams increased significantly just from 2019 to 2020. And that's right. because people fall prey to them and they believe them and, and it works. Yeah, it, it, and this is why I'm so happy we're able to speak with you because we have to keep telling people about these things because, you know, we do get a little complacent at times and we think, oh, it's never going to happen to me. But sure enough, it's going to happen to you at some point. I mean, I must get more phone calls saying that I, there's a warrant out for my arrest. <laughs> and that is scary. If you, know, if, you, if you didn't know any better, you'd be like, now, wait a minute, why would that be me? Well, just to let you know how they target people, I get those phone calls too. <laughs> that I have a warrant for my arrest and that I owe the IRS money. And it's just, they, they're just this rolling scam that keeps on, keeps on occurring. So the numbers to contact the Orange County Sheriff's Department for non-emergencies are two numbers. For South Orange County, that number is 949-770-6011. Or for North Orange County, it's 714 647 7,000. Either one of those numbers will get you to our non-emergency number. And of course, if any time you're, you're in an actual emergency where you need immediate assistance, please call 911. Yeah, we definitely need to make sure that there is some sort of way for them to uh, contact. Now, I, I it's only one minute to 11 and we haven't gotten to your police reform legislation. Do you want to take a couple minutes and talk about that? Sure. I just I, Police reform, obviously, after George Floyd has been a hot topic. And and first, let me tell you this, from, the, from a national perspective, some of the things being asked of law enforcement to do in Orange County, in Orange County Sheriff's Department specifically, we're already doing a lot of what's being recommended on a national platform about reporting of uh, bad peace officers, completing investigations, all those things we're already in. But from a national platform, there's some risk. When you look at the solution holistically, Sometimes it's not being focused on what the end result that we're hoping to accomplish to be. So I've been in dialogue with some of our congressional partners about what I think is a reasonable approach in police reform. And uh, hopefully whatever we do implement will be, uh, will be necessary. It will get us the end result that we're hoping to accomplish about accountability and transparency, but also not create unnecessary harms uh, at the same time. Uh, what we don't want to do is see knee-jerk reactions. And most importantly, uh, law enforcement needs to be at the table having these discussions and dialogues with their federal partners so that we know that we what we're, what we're implementing, first of all, can be accomplished. That's the worst thing that can happen out of legislatures to pass bills in the law that is not something that is even can be, can be implemented, the uh, first part. And a lot of these things that are being looked at, not necessarily ill-intended, but put a tremendous burden on us uh, in man hours. And I don't have new people that I can task to put on some of these things. So if we're going to do something, we have to look at the impacts on an operation so we're not taking people off the streets with their primary mission of law enforcement to do other things like collecting data uh, for other, other sources. Right, and, and one thing I'm wondering if, if you might have a resource for our community is that what if we wanted to know more about the training that police officers go through? I mean, there, there obviously is a training method. Is there some way for our community to look at something like that so they are 
better educated and better understand why a police officer would behave in a particular manner. I will tell you the best resource for, for your community or any community with Orange County to learn about what we do is our Citizens Academy. It's put on several times a year. We had to take a little break during COVID for obvious reasons, but we're starting that back up as soon as we can. And this is an eight work, an eight week class uh, where you come uh, every evening at six o'clock to eight o'clock around that time frame, And you, it's a full immersion into law enforcement through the Orange County Sheriff's Department. You will see things that we do that you probably have no idea that we do, but it also has an exposure to our training environment, how we train you get to go to our tactical training center, the Sheriff Sandra Hutchins Regional Training Center now, and see how we train. And if you are willing or able, get to shoot a firearm and do other things like that, maybe for the first time. But it gets, it's kind of a peek under the tent and really intended to be both informative and transparent about how we operate within the Orange County Sheriff's Department, as well as exposure to all the various details and assignments that we have, like the air support unit, our canine program, the jails, how they operate, so you get to see it through your own eyes. And I think it's very, it's an eye opener by any means, but also gets the opportunity to be better informed about what we do within law enforcement. Excellent, excellent. Well, we'll be, we'll be uh, talking with you soon about that. And I, maybe I'll bring a, bring a crew member with me and we'll be able to cover that for our community. I'm looking forward to it. All right, thank you so much for taking the time. Have a great day. You're welcome, thank you. And we'll be right back after this. Tomorrow, the Music Man starts at the Lutheran, well, it's not at the Lutheran Church of the Cross, it's at Aliso Viejo Christian School, but it's put on by Lutheran Church of the Cross and the Aliso Viejo Christian School. And it will run from tomorrow through August 1st, $10 per seat, and then if you would like to purchase a meal, that is also $10. And if you want more information, you can contact 949-837. 4673. And also this weekend is the Laguna Woods Gold Show, and we'll tell you more about that uh, in the next coming days, but it's July 31st from 10 to 5 right here at the Ayers Hotel. All right, let's take a look at our weather as we head out to our Enjoy Our Tuesday. Weather's looking quite nice after we burn off some of this morning fog. 8469 today, tomorrow 8468. Thursday, 8566, and into the weekend, 8467. Saturday, 8368. So it should be a nice, warm week for you. Have a great day in the village. You can always re-watch our program at 1230 and 5, or you can join us again tomorrow at 9 a.m. Bye-bye.